we're going to talk about UV and uh, we'll talk about what I know about UV. Man, oh man, my computer is going crazy right now. My screen shows you live on YouTube. That's cool. All right. You know what, Caleb? I know this isn't the most riveting ever, but uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with what we've got here. It's kind of a last minute thing. The world has gone mad. We're all hiding in our holes and bunkers, our, uh, our cages from the coronavirus. I happen to be here in my studio. I'm not allowed to leave the office, so I've been here for 72 hours straight um, living on uh, office coffee and bottled water. So this is the world we live in now, and um, you might as well just get used to it. You might as well just get used to it. So, man, we've got some good people here. Jeez, we got Neil here. We've got True Tech Tools. I'm going to check my email real quick and make sure that Ron's not trying to. Uh, so my guest isn't here yet. That's what it comes down to. Okay, my guest has not yet made it. Uh, he said that 3 p.m. would work good. And I just emailed him back the thing, but I didn't hear back from him after I emailed back the thing. And, uh, you know, that's always a bad sign. But the plan that I had was, is that even if he doesn't make it, man, I look red in this lighting. Jeez. Um, even if he doesn't make it, they were just going to talk about it anyway. Without him, based on what we've learned. So I guess I'll ask this question um, to get started. So Ron, if you're here, let me know if you show up. Fair enough. Um, the question is, does anybody have really have a problem with, yeah, he's the same time zone. Michael was asking the same time zone. Yes, he is the same time zone as me. He is a Florida man. Um, so does anybody actually have a problem with UV? And I guess I'll ask this question to Michael. Let me see. Hey, Michael, do you, are you by a microphone? Can you come on? If you can, if you can come on and actually, okay. So let me, I'm going to bring Michael on here. Cause I know Michael has said that he's not a fan of UV in the past. Yo, Michael, what's up? Hey, can you hear me? I sure can. Um, I from my discoveries, it really depends on the um, wavelength of the UV. I think there is um, applications for surface disinfectant, or in, but. Um, I kind of think that it shouldn't be the first measure of indoor air quality by any means. So I think filtration and humidity control and fresh air should be the first measures. And uh, I imagine in kind of your area and air handlers where uh, mold growth or moisture growth, however you want to say it, um, would have some some benefit but you also have to kind of be careful on what what uv we're talking about because uv can be misconstrued as other things as well right right okay and, and when you say misconstrued as other things you mean like um, pco can be misconstrued as uv because it also uses a uv light to um to act on the catalyst is that what you're talking about yes yeah and that's the same thing that I bump into a lot. I was actually talking to my son, Alex, last night about it, which he just largely ignores most of the stuff that I talk about online because it's dad. But we were talking a little bit about this, and, and I realized that he even had a little confusion about that. Um, so that was uh, that was interesting. But um, so I've spent a lot of time doing a lot of reading, um, as many of you have. I saw Nate here. I don't know if he's still here, but Michael's here. Yeah, Nate Adams is here. Um, Eric's here, Caleb's here, a lot of you, uh, Joel Becker is here. I mean, there's a ton of you who have done a lot of reading on this, but I want to see if anybody will dispute this. So, so uh, mention this in the chat if you do. Is there anybody who disputes that UVC, so that's a really um, uh, high frequency uh, type of UV, or not, it's not really high, it's just higher frequency UV um, that does not normally make it into our um, atmosphere. But that uh, some, uh, Nate says 254 nanometers is UVC. Um, that using that in close proximity to metallic surfaces, specifically evaporator coils, I think would be the primary um, application to disinfect the surface 
that is, is there anybody who says that that is a bad idea in and of itself? If we eliminate all the other possibilities there, but just that if you're using doping, so that way it's not creating ozone. Um, cause I think we would all agree that ozone is ozone equals bad nowadays. Um, at least for human occupants. Um, but is there anybody who disputes that? Are you still there, Michael? Uh, yeah, I am. I, uh, the one thing that I have a problem with is that they don't market them as kind of surface disinfecting, right? And so they still say that they clean the air and all this stuff. And I feel like that's probably misleading at least mm -hmm. uh, because they're, you know, it really matters how the dwell time or how long the air is in contact with the surface. And I'm no expert in this at all, uh, but it seems that that would be very tricky to control in most residential settings. At least. Yeah, I would agree. All right, so Eric Eric Kaiser raised his hand, which that's how, if you have something to say, you can raise your hand. So I'm going to allow Eric in here. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Eric. Oh. oh, I'm here. Oh, you're there. There you are. I was trying to unmute you, and then I kept muting you accidentally. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? So um, my thoughts are that surface disinfection is great. And from what I've seen, you know, and Michael was just talking about air cleaning. Um, by cleaning the surfaces or the surface, specifically the coil, that the air is flowing across, we are indirectly cleaning the air in that way. Also with 254 nanometer UVC, you do get some air cleaning, a percentage depending on the distance and the dwell time. And um, I do work with a, another UV company. So I've seen some of the engineering data on it and it has to do with the speed of the air going past and what um, what it actually is. And you do get quite a, um, a bit of a, a kill depending on what it is that you're looking at, uh, what specific microbes you're looking at as the air is going past the UV. It is not 100% at that point though. Yeah, and so I'm looking here at the, this is actually the ASHRAE guide um, from the 2019 ASHRAE handbook. And it does specifically talk about um, air treatment using uh, UV, uh, UVC specifically, and a couple different technologies. There's actually some that are used to kind of treat the air in an upper strata of a, of a room. But then it talks specifically about um, surface treatment and then direct air treatment. And uh, the conclusion seems to be that, yeah, it does a good job of irradiating surfaces so long as it has the intensity and so long as it is in the close proximity, um, but that it maybe struggles, um, trying to open chat back up because I just lost some of you, but maybe struggles in some cases with uh, the air, it just depending on, um, uh, depending on the velocity of the airstream, depending on the intensity of the light. Uh, and then also in the test that they did, and I'm trying to find this here because I was just looking at it, and some of the tests that they did they, they weren't really doing it on live um, targets. They were using um, proxies in order to kind of see what the impacts of the UV was. And essentially they said that we anticipate that it would be similar, um, but that they don't know for a fact. And so a lot of this testing hasn't been done super thoroughly in terms of airstreams, but it is widely used though, which is one thing I want to add, like in hospital and industrial environments, UV is widely used even in airstreams, maybe run down the length of a of a ventilation duct or something like that. And so it does seem to be um, something that is somewhat accepted, but I guess- One the of the, can I just one of the things with that and in hospitals and stuff, I feel like it's a lot more engineered than it is any other times, as well as um, you tend to see a lot of them in those scenarios you know like so it's not like throwing a single uv bulb in somewhere there's like banks of them right. in order to get the intensity and everything and so that's 
I think there's some like real distinctions and where probably most of us in the HVAC field aren't super qualified to like do that sort of engineering. Right. Yeah. I, I, I agree. And one thing that I've definitely seen, and this is where I wish I wish Ron was on the call to answer this, but one thing that's that I've definitely seen, and maybe Nate Adams would want to comment on this, is UV being being shined on surfaces like um, flexible, the inner inner liner of flexible ducts, um, things like that, where it potentially can um, degrade that material and resulting in VOCs. Now, some people have talked a little bit about ozone. And I, I'm trying to remember who it was who was talking about ozone being a factor and where it actually uh, negatively impacted somebody's health. Maybe it was Nate. Yeah, that um, was uh, Matt. That happened to Matt Milton. Matt Milton. That's right. Um, that's right. And so that's that's where the so apparently there's two different bulbs. One's 185 nanometers, and that's where ozone gets produced. The 254 it doesn't but also requires a coating on the uv bulb um my question and where it would have been awesome to have uh ron on as well is what happens as the bulb degrades as because i know they do i don't know if that means the intensity degrades or or what where maybe it gets down into that hundred and 85 nanometer wavelength and could you well, know, the, fall back we, into that ozone potential. The, the wavelength and the intensity of the light are two different things. So the intensity is how bright the light is where the wavelength is how fast that light is vibrating. So, um, so think does of that it, change over time? No, the vibration does not change. The intensity, if you think of it like a radio signal, right, from a radio tower, they broadcast on a specific frequency. So that 185 or 254 nanometers is a frequency, right? And the intensity is how much power that is actually putting out. Over time, the UV of the bulbs does degrade or the UV intensity of the bulb degrades, which is why you have to change the bulbs periodically. Bulbs are typically rated in either nine or 18,000 hours, which is either a one or a two year bulb. And that is when you look at the engineering ratings at the end of life, where the bulb is forecasted to be at the end of its life is 80% of its full capacity. So when you look at the engineering ratings on when these UV companies do engineering ratings for the commercial jobs, they rate the disinfection rate as the air is passing past the bulbs at that 80% intensity. Yeah, that makes still, some sense. Yeah, it still surprises me that they that they degrade in that way and, and from an intensity standpoint, but uh, it just doesn't that doesn't fully I don't fully wrap my head around that but I but it does seem to be the case because everybody um, references that uh, as they as they age because many and many of the manufacturers will say the reason I know this is because I would often say hey as long as the bulb is still lit you're fine and the manufacturers would say no you should still replace it uh, at the you know at the periodic uh, levels that they recommend and I always kind of thought that maybe that was a bulb sales technique technique but um, apparently there is more to it. Hey, Brian, it's Nate. Um, hey, Nate. Uh, so, uh, LED bulbs. So UV, I don't know nearly as much about as I would like. That was why I asked Dr. Shelley Miller to come on, uh, Friday. Uh, but, uh, in the case of LEDs, um, their end of life is considered when they get down to 70% of full capacity. So that's actually how it measured. It, it's measured. So when you see a 20 or 30,000 hour, uh, rating on, an LED bulb, that's technically not when it burns out. That's when it gets below 70%. Hmm. So it sounds like it's similar here. Got it. Okay. And maybe it's in that kind of range where we wouldn't notice it um, in the visible light that we are, you know, we don't, we don't notice that degradation, but, um, but in the case of 
something where it's kind of mission critical for it to do a particular irradiation job, then it, then it matters more, obviously. Um, so ma that makes sense. And I guess, you know, the, here's the, so for, for you guys, so we've got kind of a, an impromptu, impromptu kind of awesome panel here. So thank you guys for joining. I, I do appreciate that. Um, and I haven't, I haven't heard from Ron, um, but I, I just ask you guys. So obviously we've talked about kind of ad nauseum at this point about the Holy Trinity. You know, we want to control humidity. We want to control, uh, we want to filter the air um, really, really well. And we want to ventilate. And so we know those three things, but there is a lot of talk about cleaning the equipment itself. So UV is one way of sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, on surfaces of cleaning, irradiating, killing what's on surfaces. Um, based on all of your reading, because you guys have done a lot of reading, how important is that irradiation or cleaning or, uh, or sanitizing of the actual equipment itself, given COVID-19 specifically? So obviously, we know fungus and bacteria, they propagate they grow, they thrive in some of these environments, but a virus doesn't really grow outside of its host. You know, it requires its host to grow and propagate. So is it really, is this really where we should be focusing our attention? As far as on COVID-19, I or the SARS-CoV-2 virus is what it is. Right. Um, if there's bacteria on the coil that the virus would attach to, I think it would be beneficial to kill that. Is that going to stop the disease from spreading around? In my opinion, in most spaces, if it comes in, you're probably going to get it off of a surface from everything that I've read. Now, yeah, I mean, I think there's low odds that it actually makes it that far. Yeah, I, I think it's low odds that HVAC is going to really stop the virus from spreading. I think there's a lot better ways of stopping the virus from spreading than relying on an HVAC system. Well, there's the question of stopping it from spreading, right? But then there's the question I think that more people are asking, is the AC system potentially acting as a, a host or, a, or a, is it harboring it in some way? And based on everything I've read, and again, this, this is coming up a lot and I'm having these conversations and some of them are unpleasant with people because everybody wants to be able to apply solutions and products to these things that relate to air conditioning equipment, because that's what we do. And everybody wants to take action, which is understandable. Um, but I don't really think an air conditioning system based on what we're, what we know of this virus is going to act as a, a Petri dish, if you will, for this to allow it to grow and, um, and, and you know, be a real source for this. Is it possible that in the presence of fungus and bacteria that the virus could make it into the unit and survive there for a longer period of time? That seems at least plausible, though I've seen no studies to that end. Um, but we also know that on, you know, copper, for example, uh, it actually doesn't live very long. I haven't seen anything on aluminum. Uh, but do any of you have anything to add to that? So that that New England Journal of Medicine article, I forget who it was that was doing the research, but uh, um, this thing doesn't live that incredibly long on a surface. Uh, you're you're talking hours in general. Uh, so yeah, as far as it propagating inside a system, I'm not that freaked out. Um, I would prefer to pull it out of the airflow if at all possible, um, but I don't even know how much is going to be caught by a filter. Uh, I've been pinging a bunch of researchers on Twitter and the strongest statement that I've gotten from anyone is it couldn't hurt. That's the strongest statement. So if that's all the more that they're saying, I'm not too worried about it. The thing that seems to be a much bigger deal is um, keeping your humidity at least up north here on the higher side of where it normally would be. Uh, as we're finally starting to get a little warmer, it's 45 or 50 degrees today. Uh, but uh, keeping our humidity above 30% can be a bit of a challenge when it's cold out. Um, so it's the, the happy range is 40 to 60, but I always get nervous talking about 60%, even temporarily, because then some people will take it as a gospel. Oh, well, I can run as high as 60%. Um, and, you know, if they're running 60% and, uh, you know, higher temperatures, and there's all kinds of funky stuff that can happen then. Uh, so 30 to 50 is what I'm comfortable saying, personally. Um, people can say whatever they want. But the, the, the 40 to 60% 
there's a couple of different factors that it it addresses viruses and I don't fully understand them. One of them I understand it's the size of the droplets they live in or actually aerosols technically, they're this right. small. Uh, when it's dry, the drier it is, the smaller those droplets get and the harder they are to filter. So, and the longer they stay in the air. So Airborne, that right. Of it. Yeah. And the other piece of it is um, for some reason, the middle humidities, they just don't propagate as quickly. And I don't understand that. I just, I've seen that repeatedly. Yeah, well, that's what, I mean, if you go back to the, um, to the old ASHRAE chart, um, where it's got the, you know, the, the wedges, uh, tri- wedges, right. That's the term I was looking for. I want to say triangles. They are triangles technically, but they're wedges where it's got the wedges and you kind of sit right in that 50% relative humidity range. And I think that's, that's largely undisputed. I mean, like there's, um, there's cases where, uh, for some reason, I'm literally blocked out of Facebook right now. Like Facebook will not even let me open because I was going to open your um, that article that you had shared. Um, and I don't know if you can pull it up because you can probably share it from your, I can probably share it from your screen. I don't know. Are you on a phone or are you on your computer? I mean, me, Nate? Yes, you, Nate. Sorry. Um, I'm on a computer, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, I could share if you want me to. Let me... I just I just made you a panelist, so you should be right, able to. Yeah. Share screen. Let's see if it will. Sorry, bear with me. I haven't no assumed that it can do this. I'll keep talking while you while you mess around with that. The um, what I was going to say is is that part of the problem that we're facing with the whole virus thing, specifically this virus, is that we're making some assumptions based on uh, things we've seen in the past. And that's what that ASHRAE wedge is, is kind of looking at. And you do have that, you have that droplet size, and then you have how well the virus actually survives, how long it actually remains active and infectious. And that seems to be more in the middle, that infectiousness factor seems to be reduced around that 50% range in a lot of, in a lot of viruses, but we haven't done you know any significant testing on this virus. Um, but the problem is, is that in this virus, it seems like the higher relative humidities are actually better for what we're trying to do right now um, in order to keep the droplet size bigger and to get it out of the air more quickly if somebody sneezes, coughs, whatever, saliva droplets. Um, and the problem that we face is, is that a lot of our uh, preaching has been about reducing humidity in humid climates, getting it around that 50% relative humidity range. And in this particular case, we may be in a position where that actually isn't helping so much. It's helping with other immune issues. It's helping keep fungus down. It's helping with VOCs, um, helping with ozone, but not necessarily helping with the problem at hand, which is specifically um, this virus and, and how long it remains airborne. I also felt like I read something recently that uh, was talking like, humidity levels closer to 80 percent are better which is just not reasonable in any scenario other than outside you know i mean so uh seems like we can only do so much on that front really. well and, and one one thing to keep in mind here too with all these papers flying out so quickly that None of this is considered scientific fact at this point. Um, it is, when you talk about scientific fact, that needs to be something that is reproducible by multiple people in multiple situations. And when you get one paper out there, some of this stuff that's coming out, like I saw some last night or this morning that were going around that they're not even peer reviewed at this point. They're just getting literally thrown out there for anybody and everybody to read them. And I have to question because of some of that, how accurate the tests are that are being done. Yeah. And that makes it so like, and I think what, what's incumbent on us right now is to give what would be universally good advice and then hopefully provide some insights that are very likely to be true. And as it relates to this, I think, you know, this is, this is the, uh, the ACA wedges and uh, Nate's recommendation of 30 to 50%. I think that's still what we have to be suggesting. Um, you tell people in cold, uh, cold climates, cold and dry climates to increase their relative humidity 
well above 30%, even when it's cold outside, you run the risk of creating problems uh, in the actual structure and the envelope. Um, if we recommend that people go significantly over 55% relative humidity in a hot and humid climate, you run the risk of people growing fungus and all these other things that can potentially, you know, bacteria. Again, you can see here, even on this chart, virus is really, you know, you can go all the way up to 80 and it's still pretty low. Um, but you have the mites, you have the uh, fungus, you have the uh, asthma, you have the chemical, chemical interactions, all those things. Well, uh, and keep in mind, look at the date on that chart as well. If you see the date on there, it's that chart was built in 1986. It's a good year. I was four. I mean, that doesn't, <laughs> while that was a long time ago, that doesn't make it irrelevant, in my opinion. I mean... Not totally, but it may be less relevant to what we're facing today is, is my point. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and think it, I think it can be argued that, you know, saying that HVAC can solve any of this is probably pretty irrelevant. Yep, yeah, and, and, you know, my thing is that as time has moved along, things have changed. And, and that's one neat thing about scientific uh, and I'm doing Brian's air quotes here, facts, is that, um, you know, facts change as we learn and as we move forward. Um, so even that chart, I think, could potentially even be revisited today and, and maybe even updated. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I agree, especially you know, like what uh, I saw you do earlier, Eric, with uh, equating it to dew points, which would you know, be a good update to that chart. But um, at the same time, I think probably the underlying data is still relevant on that chart specifically. I, I would agree with you in general. Now, one thing too that I was thinking about here um, with the SARS-CoV-1 virus, they found that that would live in sewage systems. And I, I, there's a lot of things, obviously, in sewage systems that we don't even want to know what's in there sometimes or really even deal with. And we don't a lot of times in HVAC, but we do have to deal with them sometimes. My thought is, is it living in there because of the bacteria that exists in those systems? Or is it living in there because of the moisture or some combination thereof? And thinking about having coils being wet, if you do get the virus in there on a wet coil, um, would the, you know, because we're talking about UV and specifically the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus here, would that UV light help to, to keep anything down on a wet coil that has bacteria on it? My answer, I don't know. But I think it's something that maybe ought to be looked at. I mean, I don't think that it's moisture related. It's bacteria. Like it has to have a host and the bacteria is the host. The moisture isn't the host. True, but the moisture does promote bacterial growth on coils, yes. But this is a virus. Um, so I guess the, the, the way that I look at this is this is purely a risk management thing. There are no guarantees. We don't know everything we need to know. Even if we did know everything we need to know, there's no way that we could possibly actually control all of this stuff uh, nearly as tightly as we would like to. Um, so what suggestions do we give people, uh, HVAC contractors in particular, so that they can talk to their clients about what are the science-based pieces behind this uh, that are likely to reduce risk? Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's, and when we say reduce risk, okay. So the, the big factor here that we always have to uh, define is that there's two different sides to this risk equation. You have risk associated with the, um, how built up the immune system is of the person um, who has the potential of getting this stuff. And so people who are already um, having issues with their respiratory tract due to, um, you know, maybe allergies, or uh, maybe they're already dealing with fungus and bacteria, and you know their immune system is already dealing with that. Are they at a greater risk of uh, bad outcomes from the virus because of that? And we know that we can significantly affect those areas with the air conditioning equipment. 
Um, so again, I mean, it, the question just mostly is, are we going to make a big difference in the virus and how it impacts people and infects them by controlling these other factors that we already know are a good idea? Or are we just basically left talking generally about IAQ like we always have and just giving the same suggestions we always have? You know, what, what's really new here? Because a lot of the people who are selling products, um, and this is why I wanted to get Ron on, uh, are kind of going out there and saying, hey, look, in response to COVID, our product has been shown to uh, render COVID non-infectious or to, you know, like they say, um, disrupt the DNA, which is always interesting given that COVID is actually completely RNA, um, which is just a, you know, it's being me being uh, pedantic, but um, but is that is that is that claim um, while technically true? Is it practically true as it relates to taking a UV light and sticking it in an air conditioner and pointing it at an evaporator coil? Um, and because if it is technically true but not practically true, we should really not say it um, in those terms. We can talk about it in terms of the broader impacts that it can have on the equipment and that it may not be a bad idea like a lot of other things, but is it something that we should be focusing our attention on? My answer is no. We should go about things and talk about IAQ like we always have uh, and every other way it feels like selling to people's fear in my opinion and um, while um, I'm happy to put UV lights in for people if they make that choice it really needs to be clear that I don't think it will help with this COVID problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from a, and from a research standpoint, we know at this point that increasing relative humidities above those really low numbers is a good thing. So for people who are in dry uh, winter climates, getting their humidities up, is, is a good idea. Um, we know that ventilation air is a good idea and those two concepts can be in direct conflict with each other. Um, we know that filtration is a good idea. Does filtration really help in this particular case? I'm going to say it falls into the same category as UV lights and evapor evaporative coil cleaning. Um, certainly doesn't hurt, but is it really going to be valuable? Obviously, UV can hurt in some cases. And I would also put in the, into that category people who take UV, because I forgot to mention this, and they put it on a really dirty evaporator coil, and now they kill off everything that's on that evaporator coil and potentially uh, allow it to re-enter the airstream as it kind of dries out. And that's something that, I mean, again, I don't have any research there, but that seems like a really, really bad idea. And I've heard... Uh, just strictly in story form, nothing, nothing in a, in a study, but that people have gotten um, sick or had reactions to fungus and things that were dried out and then allowed to reenter um, the airstream after a coil, a dirty coil had a UV uh, light placed on it. Again, no, not, don't, don't, don't hold that as fact. But to me, it seems like you kind of take those things and put them in the same category. Filtration being always good for lots of reasons. Um, but is it, and, and same thing with evaporative coil cleaning, always good, but are either of those really uh, pertinent to what we're dealing with right now in any special way? And I don't, I just, I don't see that they really are. I'm curious, Brian, in your climate, as uh, you deal with a lot of high humidity and um, air handlers that, you know, have more bacterial growth than other um, scenarios, um if like what does uv solve that regular maintenance doesn't um and or so if you're doing coil cleanings on a regular basis and you know wiping down the surfaces does it actually have that much benefit aside from this whole covid thing uh really well there are some there are a lot of applications where coils are really hard to get to i mean the same is true of furnaces so um you know we do have a lot of stuff that's in the air and our filtration isn't always um 100 efficient so 
when things get through and they make it onto that evaporator coil, it can begin to grow there. And we're specifically talking about bacteria and fungus here, not viruses. And that's again, part of the, part of the, the problem here. If this was, if we were talking about a, a fungal <laughs> infection or a bacterial infection, a lot of these conversations would be completely different. This would be a, this would be a home run, you know, UV coil cleaning, those things would all make a lot of sense, but with a virus doesn't make, doesn't matter as much. Um, and so, to, but to answer your question, um, I, I would definitely put filtration above uh, UV, but it does have some value in cases where you're not going to easily be able to clean that coil completely. Um, and in a lot of, in the cases of a lot of uh, A coils or accordion coils, that can be really tough to get to. I also think there's uh, differences in insulation types, you know, like so the shiny backed insulation that's in a lot of equipment versus the dull fibrous that's you know not easy to wipe down or clean um same with duckboard you know or whatever which is common in your area i was just yeah. curious since you know you guys deal with a lot of humidity issues and units and attics or whatever just to kind of get your take on that yeah, and that's actually an interesting point because UV uh, also, I was reading uh, in the ASHRAE guide, it was talking about how UV does a lot better in reflective areas. So if you have the inside of an air handler and it's got all these reflective surfaces, you're much more likely to strike the particles from different angles as that light reflects around the cabinet. And so it's, it's you know, you kind of pointed out something there that when you have these reflective kind of smooth surfaces, they don't grow as much stuff on them. So that's good. And then number two, uh, they're, they're also more likely to be effective should you use something like UV. Uh, whereas using UV on a very um, porous type of surface like insulation, like duckboard, isn't going to be as effective because it's got to actually strike the, uh, it's got to actually strike the molecule in order to impact it. It doesn't work indirectly. So that's, you know, it, there's a lot of things that I think can be solved just through a little better engineering. And one of them is making the inside surfaces of uh, equipment smooth and maybe shiny, even if you're going to be working in, if you are going to potentially use UV as a strategy. Uh, my whole approach to all of these products, and Caleb uh, likes to get angry with me about my uh, lack of passion about some of these things. I'll throw PCO in there or, uh, you know, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide ions or whatever, um, I think they all have uh, appropriate applications. Um, and and I, in fairness, Caleb has also said that, uh, that he believes that there's applications for them as well. So I'm being a little sarcastic there. But I think they all have uh, appropriate applications. The issue isn't so much that they don't have any purpose. It's just that often they're misapplied or they're applied in a way that makes things worse. Like I mentioned, shining a UV light on the inner liner of a flex duct. Um, and I'm sure there are UV light intensities that are actually safe because um, that's come up they, they, with some of these new LED strips um, that are UVC, they're lower intensity. They're designed to be closer uh, in the case of like ductless systems, closer to the blower wheels and those sorts of things. And I'm sure you can design those in a way that that makes sense. But if a technician misapplies it, which can easily be done, or a salesman sells something in a misapplied way, then you run the risk of, of actually making the situation worse. And that's, um, I don't think we always have to be perfect. We don't always have to nail it the first time because a lot of what we're doing is kind of loosey goosey, but we have to know enough about what we're doing to try to take a good stab at helping people rather than, um, rather than just haphazardly going around throwing products at, at problems. But we've got Joel Becker with us. So thanks for joining us, Joel. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Good, buddy. You were just talking about reflective, you know, reflective services on the cabinets of these air handlers. Are you guys putting them in the, like above the coil? Cause I, I got shocked. I've always heard, you know, it's bad for the wiring. Don't have it shining on the, on exposed plastic, including insulation, wiring insulation. I, I actually got shocked last year uh changing out a, a blower motor on a unit that was maybe i don't know a year and a half or two years old so I was just wondering it sounded like you were talking about putting them uh above the coil if you're talking about the reflective insulation in the air handler cabinet yeah i mean i there are cases that we do put them above the coil and the thinking is always just um you know wrap the any wires or any exposed anything electrical 
um, or plastic with uh, metal tape in order to prevent it from being affected by the UV. Have you have you found that to be insufficient or? I don't like the idea of putting metal tape on wiring that is terminated with obviously, you know, exposed terminals or nearly exposed terminals at the ends. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure I could manage to do it safely every time, but we're talking about something that's gonna got a scale to work with three or four install crews with guys with different levels of skill and experience. So I'm, I'm kind of leery of having those guys out there throwing metal tape all over electrical wiring. Yeah. I mean, the ideal place to, to put it is uh, kind of in that uh, A uh, metal section uh, in the evaporator coil, if you have access to that and, and not all do. Um, that, that's your ideal location. Um, but then you also run the risk of exposing it, exposing your filter to it, like Neil just said. Um, and a lot of filters don't hold up well being exposed to, uh, to UV either. So, I mean, th and this is the issue. To me, the issue with UV is not the UV itself, and it's not the job that it does with irradiating the coil, you know, killing the stuff that goes on the coil. And it's not even the issue of does it uh, purify the air, because to some degree it does. Um, maybe not to a significant degree, but to some degree it does. It's more to me, if I was going to say, what is my objection to UV? My objection to UV is what you're saying, the other stuff that it's shining on and, uh, and thinking through that and controlling for all those factors, which is a difficult thing to do. Besides the fact that I've uh, looked at a UV bulb before and, and been out of service for a day uh, with <laughs> not being able to see, which is also no fun. I did that when I was uh, probably 18 years old. So you're saying because I did it when I was 24 that I'm a little dumber than you are? Uh, no. Likely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> likely, likely. Yeah. So, and that, and that kind of sums up my take on UV. Obviously, if you're talking about UV that produces ozone, well, then that's a whole nother layer. And a lot of times people mix this all in into one big bucket. UV and PCO aren't the same thing. UV and uh, you know other oxidizers will say... You know, hydrogen peroxide is one that a, uh, that a particular manufacturer talks about. Regardless, you're shining a UV light on a catalyst in order to create oxidizing ions, whether that is um, hydroxyls, um, HO, or whether it's uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, or even whether it's ozone, because, I mean, that's, that's traditionally the way that ozone's even created. All of those things are oxidizers, and there's concerns about oxidizers which are, you know, rightfully so in complete degradation and actually breathing in the oxidizer itself can be a problem. Um, the uh, Ron, uh, his company makes, uh, Fresh Air UV makes a, a PCO device, but they do use uh, carbon in conjunction with it, which I think is interesting. Um, it's similar to what uh, Air Oasis does in their uh, self-contained air purifier. There's just still a lot of factors that are hard to control for and, um, but, but even that, even that, I'm not somebody who says, do not ever put a PCO in a house. Um, I think there are cases where it might make sense. Um, in fact, Bert has one in his house, and his issue was is that his kids were getting sick all the time, um, and who knows, viral, bacterial, whatever the case may be. He did the before and after agar petri dish and showed a, a big reduction in stuff growing in the Petri dish and his kids don't get sick as much anymore. Now, does that mean that it was, is that scientific proof that it's a, an amazing product? No, but I think in his particular case, he wasn't so concerned about, um, you know, maybe some of the effects of incomplete degradation and VOCs and all that. He's more concerned about getting some of the living stuff out of the air. And I think it does serve to do that. Um, I don't fully understand all of that, but I'm not somebody who says absolutely don't do that, but I think it's over applied in comparison with the other things that we know that we can do that are better and make more sense across the board, humidity control, ventilation, filtration. Is there anybody who would dispute that? Because I'm open to that. I'm open to disputation. All right, Eric says he doesn't dispute it. Joel doesn't dispute it. You don't, want, you don't feel like joining, uh, do you, uh, Caleb? Caleb never wants to join, does he? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Michael says that he's curious about um, the sorbent type products, uh, charcoal, uh, carbon. Uh, I think 
you know, clays and uh, activated carbon, which is charcoal. You know, charcoal is just sort of the natural version of activated carbon. Um, those are pretty ironclad. Um, the problem just is, is that, you know, they only have so much capacity. So it's more like a filter where that you can't, they don't just last forever. And so um, like the fresh air UV product, uh, it uses an activated carbon cell over top of um, the PCO in order to, so the PCO, the hydroxyls um, react, and then it reabsorbs NEO3 um, or potentially incomplete uh, degraded products like um, the uh, formaldehydes or aldehydes. That's the idea. And, uh, and they've tested for that and all that, but in the way that a lot of them test, which is there's not a whole lot of industry independent testing. And that's not, yeah, so in fairness, I think this is something that has to be said about a lot of these products. In fairness, independent testing is a really hard thing to get because I mean, you can pay for testing, but then is it really independent? Um, so you have to have researchers who are really interested in doing this research. Now, the good news is, is that now I think the appetite for this sort of research is gonna be much higher as people test products um, to deal with these problems. And so I think that's a good, uh, a good thing moving forward that hopefully we'll get some better real world testing versus testing that's maybe not at real world airflows or at real world scale. Um, but anyway, that's, that's pretty much that. Can I, can I throw one more thing at you, Brian? Yeah, sure. So kind of my way of thinking about this, even though we're talking about specifically the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. My way of thinking is we got a whole bunch of people all of a sudden spending a whole lot more time in their houses. And to me, that is the bigger IAQ problem here uh, with regards to um, the people being in their houses almost continuously with this and, and going outside for very short periods of time. Does that mean we should go sell a whole bunch of products? No, I don't, I don't think so. But I think it brings up the opportunity for us to talk about IAQ with them more and give people a better understanding of what indoor air quality really is and what they can have and what's available to them. Did I lose you? Now you're back. Sorry about that. My uh, my Zoom meeting decided to crash on me. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I th I agree completely, and that and that plays into like thinking about not just not just the virus, and it's easy it's easy for us to do that. You know, it's like let's kill the virus. Well, so many people we don't even understand really what viruses are, frankly, when we say things like kill the virus, because a virus isn't really even alive in the sense that we think of things being alive. Um, so we have to think beyond that, which a lot of this is more about supporting, uh, human immune function and the kind of the really broad sense and then human respiratory function in the more specific sense. And when we can maintain human respiratory function, where we don't have as much inflammation, we're not dealing with allergies. Um, we're not dealing with fungus. We're not dealing with bacteria. Um, O3 is in, in line. We have fewer VOCs, which I think VOCs are a huge kind of new area uh, that we need to really be thinking about, um, Richard Corsi, which I, I talk about him a lot because he did, he was part of the home chem study. Uh, some of the, he was in some of Corbett's videos. Um, he talked about how we buy, you know, pillows, uh, foam pillows that come in from China and then we bury our face in them and we breathe in those VOCs every night and we wonder why we're having issues. Um, and so there's lots of things like that that are all contributing factors. And as far as we're concerned, and the air conditioning profession, we know the three main ones that we need to be controlling. And I do think we can get closer to HEPA level filtration moving forward by thinking more about oversizing filter media, using larger returns, uh, increasing our, our face area and the, and the depth and thickness of our filters um, will allow us to use better media and media maybe that's impregnated with activated carbon so it can deal with VOCs and, and all that sort of thing. Um, that's what I was thinking, for example, when we designed the AC at my dad's house, where it has essentially a measurable return static, is that now we can use much denser filters um, because we have so much return grill surface area and, you know, on the filter back side, which that's, that's Neil Comparetto and, uh, uh, and John's whole mindset about those things. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make that up. Uh, I learned that from him. 
All right, so Caleb just raised his hand, so let's bring Caleb in. Hey, Caleb, how's it going? What's up? Can you hear me? I sure can. Um, I don't know what Eric's talking about. Uh, <laughs> I don't ever want to come on, but uh, <laughs> up until now, I didn't have anything new to say, so I was agreeing with the majority of what you guys are saying. Um, but Michael did bring up um, a good point here in the chat, it says that to his understanding that there are standards um, in place for some of the technologies that we're, we're talking about, but um, no one actually tests to them, um, which is is pretty interesting. Uh, but if, if I've got the, um, the EPA third edition um, technical summary of residential air cleaners up right now, and they inside they actually have a table, I believe it's called table one here, and it lists all of the air cleaning technologies that this uh, summary covers and then it states the test standards and, and rating metrics um, that are used and that are applied for each technology and I think specifically the ones that are flying off the shelves right now like the ionizers and the uh, um, catalytic oxidation technologies the plasma and intentional ozone generation um, technologies these are these are flying off the shelves right now maybe not so much the ozone but um, for each one of those it's it, it says none specific to this technology no no test standards or rating metrics are specific to this technology and i think now more than ever um we are as a as an industry we have a responsibility to at least call um call to this call that to attention and um ask for more third-party peer-reviewed studies um and standards to be made for these technologies yeah, and I'm looking, I, I've got it pulled up now for everybody to look at. Um, so we've got catalytic oxidation, um, and it does. It says none specific to PCO, no specific test standards. Plasma, that would be also known as bipolar ionization, none specific to plasma. Um, and it gives advantages and disadvantages of each. Um, the, the disadvantages of catalytic oxidation, for example. Um, and, and again, I want to clarify when people say PCO, you and I had this conversation the other day, they're talking specifically about hydroxyls, but, but um, hydroperoxides are also created in a catalytic oxidation. So you're using a catalyst and you're creating oxidizers. And whether the oxidizer is um, a hydroxyl radical, HO, or whether it's um, hydrogen peroxide, either way, you're sending out this oxidizer in order to uh, bond with... Uh, potentially things that are in the air that you're trying to negate. And I don't see why one would create incomplete degradation, specifically um, hydroxyls and the other couldn't um, that, that would be very surprising to me. Um, right. I, th I think it's more uh, about the fact that hydroxyls, we know that if you breathe hydroxyls directly, that that's not good for you, but that's the odds of that happening are next to none because they're so reactive. That's the problem with hydroxyls, actually, as air purification technology is that they react so quickly that they generally don't make it out of that, you know, the zone that the purifier is installed in, where some of these other ions, oxidizing ions, can make it further. O3 being a great example, where O3 can really make it out into the airstream, um, but that actually makes it worse because now it's more likely that you're actually going to breathe it in and it's going to act as a respiratory irritant. And that's the challenge, right? Is that we can test and we can say it's effective, um, meaning that, uh, for example, it reduces, it kills certain things, um, but is it safe still? Because that's a totally different question. Whether or not it kills certain things is one part of the equation. We can take the Petri dish and we can show before and after, and we have. We've shown that in real life um, applications where you do a before test, you do an after test, and of course, we're not controlling for every factor. That's impossible to do. But when you do it enough, you see that there is uh, there is some impact. And is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, on the face of it, it seems like a good thing. But on the other side, if you have incomplete degradation, is it possible that that's resulting in um, other, other issues? Right. Absolutely. And um, for clarification, I think you, you said plasma as ionization. Um, when I think that they actually... Uh, they specify what ionizers, because that's that they're trying to attack particles um, by just clumping them together. 
plasma, I think, is actually they're actually attacking um, the bonds of gases. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they call bipolar ionization cold plasma. That's a common term that's used for bipolar ionization, which is actually just free electrons in a plasma. And that's what a plasma is, is you essentially just have free electrons. It's not just, um, it's not a chemical compound like others are where you're actually, uh, or, or, or an actual um, uh, substance, uh, an ionized substance, it's actually just free electrons. At least that's my understanding of what, uh, when we say cold plasma, that's that's what uh, bipolar ionization is talking about. But again, you know, <laughs> so much of this is learned from reading people's uh, literature and uh, trying to kind of parse it as best you can. Um, I have uh, Arturo here. Um, do you have a question or something to add, Arturo? Yeah. Um, good afternoon, guys. Hey, man. I'm just, there it is. I had a, a buckle up my seatbelt. I've seen a post uh, by Nate Adams, probably, I want to say maybe two, three days ago about the, we're talking about the probiotics and uh, really having, it's, a, it's kind of like a gray area. There's been little research done about it um, as far as it, you know, killing the, the bad bacteria and leaving around the good bacteria. Have we uh, actually done some reading up on that stuff yet or is it still out gray area because you know there's a the better air better air products that uh some some guys are out there trying to uh offer to the market so to me i have one of those products i have not really used it to say hey it, it works wonders uh i'm just wondering what what y'all thought about the probiotics Uh, I'll tell you what I think off the top of it, which I, it's completely, I have not tested it, but first off, let's just say what we know about it, which is a probiotic. So what are you adding? You're adding good bacteria to the airstream, right? Um, what is good bacteria going to do? Is good bacteria going to kill a virus? Uh, maybe they say it does. I don't know how that would work. Um, does it, uh, does it potentially kill other bacteria? Yeah, I, I, I imagine it, it potentially could. Um, but again, my understanding of good bacteria is that it uh, primarily is going to act within us, within our gut biome, whatever. That's what I'm used to, right? We have good bacteria that lives in our gut biome. Um, it helps to digest things. Um, there's uh, uh, bacterial cleaners that are being used, probiotic cleaners. There was a great podcast titled Architectural Yogurt, done on the Building Science Podcast, um, which is uh, done by the positive, the guys Positive Energy uh, down in Austin. It talked about, you know, using probiotic cleaners. And that, that seems to make a lot of sense to me to eat away biofilm in the same way that enzyme-based cleaners we use, same, same basic concept. Um, but taking it and throwing it in the air, um, if it's good bacteria that uh, is okay on our gut and, you know, it's okay in our lungs, I guess, um, probably fine. The question isn't so much, is it dangerous as is it actually effective? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And if you listen to them, they'll say that it is. The only people I've interacted with um, who talk about probiotic um, air purification are just salespeople, just, just salespeople. And I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with salespeople. Okay, let's be honest. I do have a problem with salespeople, but... I want to talk to scientists, um, researchers, people who have done real studies on this stuff. And um, and yeah, and Michael says, I think the guy who sells them, I'll just read it. He says, I think the guy who sells them is a weasel. Does that count as valid opinion? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've had some of the same feelings and they're not un, they're not without basis. I'll put it that way. I've done some research, uh, but that doesn't mean that the technology is bad. So technology could be great. I just don't know yet. I don't know what type of uh, research has been done. And, um, and I'm not quick to throw things in my customer's airstreams. Because again, you have to establish um, that it is both safe and effective. You can't just, there's lots of stuff that's safe that doesn't do anything. And I'm not going to sell that to my customer. And there's lots of stuff that does something that may not be safe. And I'm not going to sell that to my customer unless they understand the risks. Like for example, ozone is, is a good example. If I had... <clears throat> a space that had a, uh, you know, 
a crime done it and it was all this you know there was all this bacteria and odors and all this stuff and i was trying to sanitize it with no one present would i have a problem putting an ozone generator in there along with regular um dis you know disinfectants in order to help treat that space and then ventilate it and then go in and do my cleanup sure absolutely um that's a good technology there's nothing wrong with ozone intrinsically the problem with ozone is breathing it into your lungs um, and so I think that's true of a lot of things that we have to, it's all about matching the application. I keep saying this over and over again, but in order to match the application, you have to know something about it first off. And you have to have some data that tells you something more than just, um, sales stuff. And that's the problem I have with IAQ that doesn't apply to other parts of our industry. It's why I really dislike our IAQ as a part of our industry. Um, because it just has so many things that are just guesswork. Uh, versus if I install a compressor properly um, and, and I can take all the measurements when I'm done, I, I know that it's done properly. You know, I don't have ambiguity because even in sensors and, you know, uh, Caleb's kind of my go-to right now doing a lot of this research and testing the sensors and talking to manufacturers and coming up with all these answers to things uh, because there is just so much of that. And even for me, um, I, I have a lot of, I have more questions than I have answers, frankly. I think a lot of us do. And so it's easier just to stick with what we definitely know, which is filtration, dehumidification, um, and ventilation. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, just having a product out there claiming that it does wonders and it kills this and it does this without having an actual fact sheet and actual going through a process. I mean, this product just came out about what, probably two, three months ago. And they're just pushing that so hard without knowing the actual facts. And I, I do stand behind what you say about knowing what you're selling and, and the effects of it and not just going out there and selling it because you want to make money. And then that's the end of the story. So I do agree with you 100%. We got to know the facts before we actually push a product. Yeah. And I think there's a, um, like, I, I'm careful not to throw shade on people who are um, selling products that they believe in for, because, you know, like, I'm not the, uh, I, I, I'm not the har the keeper of all knowledge, you know, about these things. And so some people may have some, a level of confidence or experiences that lead them to sell products that I'm not comfortable with. And I think that's okay. Um, but I would really like to see a future in which um, indoor air quality products are tested to the same degree that we test electrical products like with UL um, or we test, you know, refrigeration air conditioning products like with AHRI. That, that to me makes um, a lot of sense that we would start to test things. And even those tests, we know they're not perfect. Nothing in this world is. Um, mistakes are still going to be made. Products will still make it to the market that aren't that effective or maybe aren't that safe. But having some more testing uh, and some better standards that we can go by with something as important as indoor air quality. Cause it just, it's a bummer in one sense, because it's such a huge opportunity right now for us to shine a light on really good quality indoor air quality practices. But the problem is, is we don't have that. We don't have that smoking gun. We don't have that, Hey, do this. And it will save you from, uh, you know, from COVID-19. It just, we just don't have that. And there's other people who are selling people boxes who are giving them people that, um, that faith and the and the, the sad thing it's not sad it's actually it's kind of a good thing i guess is that a lot of times when you sell people a solution they believe in it does actually protect their health because it gives them the placebo effect where guys like me i don't give them the placebo effect because all i do is say well you know this could help and and here's a wide range of things you can do uh you know it, it's not as uh, it doesn't give people that confidence that they sometimes want to hear and, uh, and I guess it's just, you know, we all play a different role. I, I feel like my role in all of this is to say, um, let's, not, let's not make overstatements on either side of this equation, but let's look at what we do know. Um, because it's the same thing. Like I have a couple of my best sponsors are, are cleaner companies and they would love to, you know, sell their cleaners as the solution to these problems. And I, I think it, it's good to clean equipment, you know, properly. So I'm always happy to say that, but is that really a solution for COVID-19? Is that really something that is a big uh, part of this, of this process? And as I stand right now, or as it stands right now, I don't think it is. Um, I think probably the biggest factor as it relates to COVID-19 specifically is to stay really healthy yourself and to clean surfaces uh, and don't touch people a lot. <laughs> you know, like that seems to be the, the biggest, 
you know, the biggest thing you can do to protect yourself uh, from this particular virus is it doesn't function like bacteria and, and fungus and fungus does. All right. Anything else, Caleb, anything else to add there? Um, as far as from my understanding, having looked at some of the studies that have been done on probiotics um, specifically, it's less of an air treatment. Um, it is the, the way that a specific technology, this specific technology works as far as what I've, I've looked into is that they, they actually release the probiotics um, by way of micro misting. Um, so there's a bit of a concern as far as um, certain climates, as far as are you adding humidity into the air? And the answer is yes, but they're not, they're not trying to attack anything in the air. They want the probiotics to land on surfaces. That's the whole probiotic um, concept as far as the, the purifying. They're not actually trying to fight anything that's inside the air um, because the, the idea is that, well, bacteria, they don't grow in the air. They grow on surfaces. Um, and that's what they're trying to, to attack is they want it to become airborne, but then as it falls out, it's going to land on surfaces that um, propagate the, the growth of bacteria and um, other micro um, biological growth, and they're going to attack it that way. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and again, I would just have to, and, and I know that they're making claims that it does help kill viruses. Mm -hmm. um, that just seems, that's very surprising to me. It doesn't mean could because things surprise me that it's wrong. It just, it just, seems surprising so i would like to see more data on that and um and it, more data less talking <laughs> more real life tests less uh sales jargon um and and i'd be the first one to uh, be excited about any product that's going to help people so you're here maybe not the first one i might be like the the fifth or sixth one kayla would be before me all right, cool. So is there anything we missed on UV? Anything? Because that was what we were supposed to talk about, but then we ended up not really talking about it that much. Um, anything else we missed there? I don't think so. I think it. Um, I, I put in the chat the um, the wavelengths and everything. I think Eric was talking a good bit about that. Um, the wavelengths from my research, and I can, I can find the link as far as that study goes. There's a website um, called oxidationtech.com, and it's this, this whole study on uv light and what it's it, what it states is the uv light wavelengths um between 160 and 240 nanometers that's the wavelength rate range that creates ozone and so that's something to to be aware of when you're choosing a uv bulb also to understand that all uv light produces a range of uv wavelengths that might be rated for a specific wavelength but almost never will it be consistent with one single wavelength um, so paying attention to that type of way, uh, range is important when you're, uh, you're putting it inside someone's home. Yep. Yep. For sure. And uh, again, I'll just end with um, if you use UV as a strategy, along with filtration, you're looking at dehumidification and humidification, you're looking at ventilation, you're honestly doing that, um, then I'm fine with UV. But I think like what a lot of these guys have said, it's probably not the thing you want to focus on. And I understand why people do focus on it because it's easy to install, easy, easier seeming to sell. But that's where you got to kind of look at yourself in the mirror and decide, like, are you, are you really focusing on a product because it's the best for the customer? Or are you focusing on it because you can get in and get out and make a profit? And, you know, obviously we're all profit motivated to some extent. We all got to have to make a living, but you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and uh, be honest about that. And, uh, and of the products that are out there, UV as a, as a surface radiation or irradiation technology to kill stuff on the evaporative coil specifically, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fine thing. And I've seen it work well. Um, you got to take into account the lifetime maintenance costs of it and you got to communicate clearly with your customer about it and how it works, what it does do, what it doesn't do probably as well, which specifically is it probably doesn't do much for um, disinfecting the airstream itself. But, uh, but yeah, cool. So lots of, lots of good stuff to, to read and research out there. Um, always uh, feel free to email me if you find something interesting. Brian at HVACRschool.com. Brian with a Y at HVACRschool.com. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I appreciate you all. Have a great day.